Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're uh, real happy to bring you another edition of Office Hours from Infinix Healthcare. Um, honored to, today to have Julie Graham with us. Um, we're going to take a deep dive into cardiology coding and specifically what is uh, going on so far this year. We're going to look at some trends. We're going to look at some updates. Um, do a little uh, introduction on Julie. She is a senior coding manager uh, for Infinix and uh, brings a, a wealth of knowledge and expertise specifically um, in the cardiology space. Uh, Julie currently manages accounts uh, for Infinix clients. She provides education and audits uh, to providers across the country. Um, and uh, Julie, with that, do you want to just give a little bit of background on yourself? Yes, thank you, Bo. Um, I've been in the healthcare field since 2008. Um, I mainly do cardiology, um, interventional radiology, and cardiothoracic surgery. Um, I have my bachelor's degree in healthcare administration, and I have been with Infinix for two years, and I love my job. I love what I do, and I'm very happy to be here today, so thank you. That's great. That's great. Well, why don't we jump right in here? Um, got a little slide deck we're going to go through. Um, we thought we'd um, kind of pop right into a pretty popular topic, the 2024 proposed Medicare fee schedule. Um, if, if your practice or your facility or um, maybe if you're inside of the health system arena, um, you know, your revenue cycle group is, is, is keeping up with the kind of the latest of what we're seeing from the various outlets. Um, we are up for uh, another uh, you know, fee schedule adjustment here to the professional fees. Um, never like seeing this, uh, obviously, coming out of CMS. But, um, you know, we as a billing company want to do everything we can to partner uh, with, with, with you as a, as a medical group or a provider of services. Um, and with that, um, Julie, do you want to just give us a little overview of, of what could potentially be installed this fall? Yes, so CMS has proposed a, uh, as you can see by the numbers, has proposed a 3% reduction for diagnostic radiology, a 4% reduction for our internal, or excuse me, interventional specialist, and a 2% reduction for nuclear medicine, which directly impacts our cardiology sector. Um, and overall, Medicare has proposed a 3.3% um, a six percent reduction from the 2023 amount um, these are not ideal numbers obviously for providers they they've been taking cuts year after year um, and you know with inflation and their overhead costs and supplies um, you know their malpractice insurance this is just not an ideal cut for providers um, i would suggest that providers use their voice um, you know, Medicare offers online a place to voice your opinion. Comments are being taken up through September 11th on this topic. So encourage your providers to use their voice and even to reach out to members of Congress um, and urge them to support efforts to stop the cut. So that's great, Julie. So let's take a, a step and uh, maybe just kind of deeper into this. And, and specifically, let's let's talk about it in the cardiology space. I I see we've got, um, you know, the potential cuts to the various um, modalities that we could do diagnostic yeah. events for in the cardiology space. Um, if you were a coder uh, of a cardiology practice um, or similar out there and, and you know some of these, um, you know, potential cuts are coming in regards to, um, you know, eventually how we code bill and, and collect for these, what would you be doing? Would you be focusing on your specificity? Um, would you be focusing on uh, audit? Uh, would you be meeting with the providers? Maybe just give us a little overview of what you would be doing to make sure um, really the revenue is maximized. Yes, I would, you know, for these individual areas, I would make sure that uh, the providers uh, are educated on these cuts and also the, the procedures that are going to impact them the most. And from a coding perspective, I would suggest that coders uh, be vigilant and ensuring that all, cap, all codes that can be captured are captured uh, to help you know, mitigate the loss uh, for providers. Sometimes codes are missed or there's not an understanding in the application of codes. So I would look at it from that perspective and see where 
uh, those cuts can be kind of mitigated to improve revenue overall, to improve the reimbursement for the provider. Okay, that's great advice. So more to come on that and um, uh, please stay uh, in close touch with our uh, Infinix LinkedIn feed and we'll do more updates on, on fee schedule changes as they come. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit today too about um, you know, really what the status of telehealth and telemedicine was uh, kind of quasi leading into uh, the public health emergency and pandemic, what it was during and, and really what providers are up against today um, when it comes to uh, you know, properly billing. So you can see on the screen here that Julie's laid out a kind of the telehealth codes and the telemedicine codes. Um, Julie, do you want to give us a little bit of just, again, overview of kind of what was going on during the pandemic versus, um, you know, what guidelines we should be following today? Yes. Uh, so, you know, these codes prior to the, prior to the end of the PHE, um, there was, there was no ending on, there was no definite ending on when these would take place. Uh, for now, the CMS has, uh, stated that they will extend these codes through 2024. Uh, most of the guidelines remain the same. The, the telehealth services 99202 through 99215 and 99221 through 99233 still require that two-way interactive audio and video component. And that should be documented uh, within the provider's note to state that the patient was seen uh, with implementation or utilization of a two-way uh, interactive audio and video. There should also be documentation that patient has given verbal consent. Those verbal consents last up to one year. Uh, so that will get you through uh, pretty much through the end of 2024, which is when these services will go away. These services should be reported with a modifier 95. And this is CMS guideline with place of service 11. I would like to mention a little caveat. Uh, UHC differs a little bit. They're the commercial plans, United Healthcare. I have seen where they would like to see the place of service too. However, CMS has stated they, they don't want place of service too. So um, providers need to make sure that that documentation is within their office visit note. I have seen where providers are billing for telehealth services, but the documentation doesn't actually meet telehealth. It's more of a telemedicine because the guidelines were not met or because the, the documenta documentation specifically states the visit was performed via telephone call. So when we move over to telehealth, or excuse me, telemedicine, um, now these codes can no longer be reported for new patients. Prior to the end of the PHE, May 11th, 2023, these could be reported for new patients. Um, they will no longer be allowed for new patients. And now CMS has also stated that if there is an audio only visit that the provider must document the reason that that audio video, audio video technology could not be used, uh, which is different than what the previous expectations were, the previous documentation requirements. And also of note, these codes will be deleted in 2025. They'll be completed uh, or deleted completely from CPT. So that's something to keep in mind. Another area of misutilization I've seen is uh, providers using 98666 through 98968. And I think this is more just of a confusion thing. Um, these services describe work for non-physician services, non-physician practitioners, such as PT, OT, social workers, and clinical psychologists. So uh, do not utilize those codes. They're, those codes are also instigated or started by the, the patient or by that social worker, PT, or OT. So you definitely don't want to use those codes unless you meet those guidelines. And these codes are actually no longer covered after 5-11-23, so. So lots to take in uh, there for sure. Um, you know, again, uh, many in the clinic uh, group that I speak with or, or, or clients that we talk with, you know, telehealth and telemedicine are a wonderful resource and a wonderful tool. Um, so, you know, our advice uh, uh, to our clients or potential clients and 
and everybody out there that's trying to make sure the claims get through clean is, you know, got to do that first first visit in person, um, and then you know follow the follow the rules uh, from there. It's it's such a convenient option for patients. So again, we want to make sure everybody has the the latest information. So thank you, Julie, for walking us through that. Um, we're going to keep moving on here. Um, had a little bit follow up on these guidelines. Um, Julie, anything else you want to say about this one? Yes, and these are also important guidelines to keep in mind. Um, CPT says that with the telephone services, if that telephone call ends with a decision to see the patient within 24 hours, then the code is not reported. That encounter would then be considered part of the pre-service work for a subsequent ENM procedure or visit. And likewise, if the procedure, if the telephone call refers to an ENM service performed or reported by that individual with the, within the previous seven days, uh, it is not considered part of that ENM service. You also, um, or excuse me, it is considered part of that ENM service. Uh, you also cannot use this the tele the telephone codes the nine nine four four one three four four three two if a patient calls in for a prescription refill uh, that's not something you can utilize that code for so just some things to be aware of and really read those guidelines in your CPT book and discuss with your providers so that they know discuss with your your NPs and your PAs uh, so they're aware of those guidelines and. Um, you know, make sure that, that that's followed. And so you you receive the reimbursement you deserve. Okay, thank you. That's great. Um, switching topics here, uh, and Julie and I work together and, and meet with clients pretty off, often on our next topic. Um, the rules have, have changed uh, frequently. And it's sometimes hard for, um, you know, small, medium and large groups uh, to keep up with. So incident two, um, you know, big topic. I, I know in my experience as a former practice administrator, uh, we would have to meet real regularly with the nurse practitioners and the doctors meet together as a group uh, to, again, walk through all the necessary documentation and make sure everybody understand the CMS guidelines here. So um, nice slide uh, you have here. Can you go ahead and kind of tell us what the what the big concerns are that we need to look out with for, for the latest in Incident 2 billing? Yes. So first and foremost, to bill incident two, you need to make sure that your NPPs or your QHPs are credentialed with Medicare and enrolled under your PTAN. Uh, since Medicare allows for credentialing of these uh, qualified healthcare professionals, that needs to be done to be able to report incident two. Um, and there is also, I've seen some confusion between incident two and split shared. And so I think it's important for providers to remember and, and coders alike, that incident to our services that are not provided in the hospital or the skill or a skilled nursing facility. These are services provided uh, in, in the office and your split shared services are the ones that we see out in the hospital sector, out in the hospital uh, area where that those services are able to be reported. Uh, under the incident two guidelines, the NPPs cannot see new patients there must be an established plan of care uh, for the, the NPP to see, a, uh, to see an established patient. Uh, if the patient is seen for a new reason during that visit, say they, you know, they have their established plan of care set forth by their, the provider, they're seeing the NPP and they come in or they discuss a new problem for which the NPP addresses and then creates a, you know, a treatment plan for, decides to prescribe some medications, uh, then you can no longer report those services as incident two. It would then be billable under the provider only. Uh, also, if, um, if the patient came in and no other changes, you know, no changes were made other than maybe the patient complains of their uh, medication not working or having issues with their medication and the NPP makes any changes to the medication, again, you would not be able to bill under uh, incident two. So another thing that this is, you know, this is not a mandatory requirement, but it's something that can, you know, support your documentation and that's co-signatures. So co-signatures of both the physician and the NPP is not required. But like I said, they serve as evidence for incident two and can support your documentation should there be 
a request for audit or you need to support your records um, or support your claim with records. And it's also important to remember that incident two is a Medicare billing provision. So not all uh, commercial payers are going to follow the same rules. They may not even allow incident two. So that's something real important to remember and speak with those payers to see if they uh, follow incident two guidelines or if there's reimbursement for such services. Okay, very helpful, very helpful. We'll keep moving here. Um, just to kind of summarize, um, you know, again, kind of what I talked a little bit about, it's just, it seems like education is just the most important thing. So, you know, if you're having a monthly meeting with your with your group at the clinic or a, a monthly virtual, uh, really seems like education is the key here. Am I right? Yeah, I think, you know, it's important for uh, coders uh, to educate, you know, and providers alike to work together in tandem to make sure everybody's educated. You know, the, the guidelines and the requirements come from the coders. They're communicated to the providers, to the NPPs, and make sure that everybody is aware of those regulations and guidelines so that, you know, your re you can maximize your reimbursement on that um, and ensure that the documentation reflects the services provided. Um, and then I've already mentioned that, you know, this is a Medicare billing provision. So commercial payers will not always follow the incident to rules. Okay. Okay. Hope everybody can, uh, you know, bear some fruit from, from this uh, piece of the presentation. I, you know, the utilization of uh, you know, doctors, nurse practitioners, and other technicians in the clinic is, is very important. And we want to make sure when you, when you bill for your services, you're getting there the revenue for the work done. Um, Absolutely. Keep moving here. Um, we thought we'd do an ICD-10 uh, update and what's coming in 2024. Um, you can see here, Julie's brought us quite a bit of detailed information. I know Julie and I talk about um, kind of how we're going to plan and prep and help our, our customers in the coming uh, you know months prepare. So I'll just kind of jump right into it here. Do you want to give us a quick overview on this slide, Julie? Yeah, so as as the coders on the call will know, uh, CMS uh, updates the ICD-10 CM twice a year. Those code changes take effect in April and October of each year. So we're just around the corner from our next uh, update in October, October 1st, 2023. And CMS has announced there will be 395 new diagnosis codes with 25 deletions and 13 revisions, and those will be effective October 1st, 2023. There are some uh, changes that directly affect um, the coding or the, the cardiology area of coding. Mm -hmm. uh, three codes have been deleted. So the I20.8 for other forms of angina uh, pectoris have been has been deleted. Uh, I24.8 and also SVT I47.1. Uh, and it's important that this is these things are updated in your billing EHR so that come October 1st, you know, the provider sec selects these codes or uh, these codes are entered into the system and they don't get sent to the insurance uh, and the claim kickback for eliminated deleted codes. So it's important that those bill at your EHR system is updated to remove these new codes and get those 10 additions uh, added. Okay, sounds great. And then diagnosis codes. Yeah, I really found some of these pretty interesting. Um, I'm really excited to see the, the guidelines for this new resistant hypertension code. Um, I'm kind of curious what that's all about and how that will be applied. Um, and then you also see uh, this microvascular dysfunction that's been added on a few of these codes. And so I think that this will uh, necessitate a discussion, you know, as coders with your providers to dis discuss these new codes with them and make sure that their documentation will be specific enough to support these codes. Uh, we're not always able to garner or pull out um, from the clinical documentation to support these codes. So we really depend on our providers to have clear and concise documentation of clinical diagnosis codes. Um, and as you can see, the, you know, the super ventricular tachycardia codes, they've been, it's now been expanded into three. So I-47.1 was deleted 
And now there are three codes for that section. So we still have the unspecified code, um, but we also have a code for inappropriate sinus tachycardia and then other supraventricular tachycardia, which will be used when um, there's another uh, definitive SVT documented that doesn't meet the I-47.10 or the I-47.11. Okay, well, that's great detail. And if anybody has questions, again, we can put them in the chat. Um, we'll just keep moving here. Um, these are the revised, am I right? Yes, that's correct. And really the, the, the revision we see here is going from abdominal aorta to uh, thoracoabdominal aorta. So as you can see, the ones that are that are bolded, um, that's where the that's where it's been revised from abdominal to include that thoracic uh, abdominal aorta, not just the uh, abdominal aorta. So and then with the first one, um, it I wonder if it was I don't know if it was a typo or not, but it says um, you know atherosclerotic. So that's been changed to atherosclerotic. Got it. Okay. So, you know, kind of work, working through some of the, the detail we've covered today, um, uh, and, and maybe to just go back and summarize it, uh, and, and you and I see this a lot when we talk coding and billing, um, when we think of denials, and when we think of denials that, that um, we see customers and clients uh, getting in the cardiology space, um, I wonder, if, uh, again, as we've discussed in the past, could you hit on maybe just one or two trends that you've seen uh, this year um, in uh, denied claims and, and you know, what those codes are? And, and then maybe just, you know, give our group a, kind of one more, uh, you know, kind of what to look out for as they go on uh, throughout their clinical provision the rest of the year. Absolutely. So one, you know, there's a few things that jump out to me immediately that I'm thinking about. And one of those is the the pacemaker procedure um, and the ICD because these both of these procedures have an NCD. So coders are no longer allowed to rely on just the billing and coding articles, um, which generally give us you know covered LC covered diagnosis codes, which kind of which makes it easier. Uh, but these NCDs are very uh, heavily latent with clinical doc clinical requirements. And so I think it's real important that coders speak with their providers, share these NCDs with them, discuss it in an open, you know, open forum and say, you know, read over these clinical requirements, these clinical, uh, you know, docu the, the clinical requirements that are needed in your documentation to support the billing of these services. Because like with the pacemakers, the 33206 through 33208, uh, the, when you of sign that KX modifier on there, you're basically communicating to Medicare that you've met the requirements listed therein of that NCD. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's important that that stuff is, is that the providers know. Um, and because there's so much clinical documentation that it may be hard for the coders to really interpret and understand, we can work together with our providers to know what to know when those uh, requirements have been met and the diagnosis codes that uh, follow that would support medical necessity. Okay. Um, another one I, I think of is, you know, there's a lot of procedures out there right now that are part of clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And so it's real important that the claims are submitted with the appropriate information um, on first pass. Otherwise, that can lead to kickbacks and denials because there's certain elements missing. Uh, maybe this CTN number was not placed in the right area on the code or on the claim. It should be placed in the, demonst uh, the demonstration project identifier area. Uh, it should be numbers only. Do not add NCT or CTN. Um, you need to make sure that the Q0 modifier has been applied on the CPT code itself. And for procedures like the TAVR that require that 62 modifier requires a co-surgery co -surgery between a, a cardiologist um, and another, you know, a CT surgeon or another cardiologist, make sure that that 62 modifier is the first listed, um, then your Q0. And you always are going to need your Z00.6 code. Um, 
so because that is for the clinical, that's for the investigational uh, trial that communicates to the payer that this is part of that uh, trial and that's the, uh, it's covered under that. And then you, that should be your secondary diagnosis code. Your primary code should be the reason for the implantation, you know, like, uh, or the reason for the service with the tab or with the, the leadless pacemaker or the watchman. So really making sure that all those required elements are on the claim will help eliminate those, those, those uh, denials that we, we often see. And then um, third, this is not really um, a, anything that leads to a not denial. I just think it leaves, it leaves uh, money on the table. You know, it's missed, re sure. re missed revenue. Yeah. So for like the embolization codes, the 37241 through 37244, um, you can bill selective catheter placements for those. And sometimes when I re do audits and I review reports, I notice that those selective catheter placements aren't captured, which, right. you know, that's, you know, missed opportunity for revenue. And then also with... Um, the the PTA and the stent codes for like the three seven uh, the three seven two four six through three seven two four eight or three seven two three six uh, three seven two three eight those codes are for PTA and or stent of the vein or artery and you can also report catheterization codes with those um, procedures as well but I do see those missing and I think it's you know. In this area of coding, there's so much. I mean, when I started in 2008, there wasn't all this inclusive coding, and mm -hmm. and it's just there's so much to remember as coders. There, it really, really there really, really is, you know. And so, great. We've um, had a Julie. We've had a, a quick question come in here. Uh, um, just heading back to the the public health emergency telehealth telemedicine discussion we were having. Mm -hmm. um, well, we've had uh, somebody have the question of, have they given any updates uh, on the AUC CDSM program? Um, goes on to say earlier, they were, would potentially reinstate after the declared end of the PHE. Would you know anything about that particular uh, issue? Uh, you know, I think I was just reading something about that the other day, and I thought where I, it said something where CMS has decided to still it's still suspended indefinitely at this moment, okay. but I could do, let me, let me look research. At, yeah, do some research on that. And I can, okay. I can get back with them on that question. That's great. Well, Julie, thanks so much. Um, that concludes our time today. Um, if anybody that was uh, uh, tuned in or, or, or customers that, that may want to uh, chat with Julie or, or potentially um, understand uh, our audit services or, um, uh, meet with the coding and audit team that um, Julie works with and that is at our, our highly skilled team here at Infinix. Um, please reach out to a representative and we'll set up some time to, to meet with you and to meet with your uh, potential team and, and to understand how we can help. Again, thanks so much for the time today, Julie. Thank you.